So it becomes pretty clear that when you're trying to talk about probability, an important place to start is figuring out the sample space, at least in the classic view or the analytic view of probability. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Now, figuring out sample space can be straightforward in some contexts, such as our examples about a coin. It's pretty easy to say, okay, the sample space contains heads and tails. Like, I've solved for it. I'm done, right? Uh, similarly, pretty simple to figure that out with a die, right? You know there's six sides on it. You have a die that you know has 100 sides. So when you have easily predefined sample space, it's pretty simple. Obviously, it's a much harder thing to figure out, like, well, what's the sample space for the you know car buying example? Um, if you just say, well, how many cars are on the lot? Okay, the question is, is that really the sample space that we're dealing with? You know, you have to figure out the cars are in your price range or your interest. Like, are there things that constrain the sample space further? Um, in many cases, sample space is inordinately large, which means that solving for it becomes uh, difficult, if not impossible. You know, if you have wanted to talk about what's the probability of a human being depressed, uh, that sample space is impossible, right? The denominator to figure out um, how many humans and how many humans who are depressed, right? To get those statistics would be impossible, not just in like present time, right? Trying to say, well, how many humans are there really? Like we have estimates, but we don't know at any given moment the true number of humans on the planet. Similarly, knowing the true number of humans who are depressed at any moment on the planet, also impossible. And if you talk about humans, then do we consider it over the span of history? Do we go into future? Um, it becomes very obvious that sample space becomes essentially impossible to figure out in some contexts. And we'll try to deal with that more when we move into you know, discussing other views of probability. But in the basic concepts, talking about solving for sample space, when it's knowable and definable, which are important things to consider here, um, there's a couple ways we can go about this. One way is kind of visual. It's called tree diagrams. So let's think about the example. Obviously, when we, when we roll, um, we often don't roll a single die. We roll dice, right? Like you play Monopoly or craps. Uh, a lot of times you roll two dice at once. So if we wanted to say, well, what are the, what's the probability of certain outcomes, we first have to figure out, well, what's the sample space that we're dealing with when we roll two dice? It's no longer just six, right? There's no longer just six outcomes, and it's not six plus six, 12 outcomes, right? What is the number of outcomes? Well, if we use a tree diagram visually to think about the sample space, we can say, for example, that we're rolling two dice, and with rolling two dice, uh, the first dice can come up with one of six possibilities, right? A one, two, three, four, five, or six. Now, for the sake of space here, I've only done one additional branch, but once we roll and get an answer on one die, so say we get a two on one die, there are six possibilities that could happen on the second die, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, also realize that these six possibilities could happen on on any of these outcomes. So if you don't know that it was a two, right, if you roll them concurrently, you could get a one, two, three, four, five, or six on the first dice and a one, two, three, four, five, six on the second dice. So you'd have six nodes on the first dice that would, first die that would break off into six additional nodes for each of these. So if you think about that, you quickly realize you end up with six nodes that have six nodes, which is 36 possibilities. So for example, if I needed snake eyes, I would have, there's only one way that snake eyes can occur. Both die must come up with a one. For both dice to come up with a one is one possibility out of a space of 36, right? So there's a one in 36 probability, right? Or said another way, the odds are one to 35 that you could end up getting snake eyes. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. So this hits on an interesting idea, too, that I'm going to touch on briefly, and we'll come back to later in the course, that there's a difference between probability and odds. Sometimes the word risk, especially in health and disease contexts, is substituted for probability. But here, probability is the event over the sample space. We'll talk about that. So it is what you want to happen divided by everything that could happen. So essentially your denominator is the whole. It's the, the number one, right, in the, in the context of zero to one probabilities. Now, odds are different. Odds are phrased not in a one in 36, but odds are phrased with the word two. So one, two, 35. Now that's different because an odd represents the probability of an event 
against the probability of a non-event. So an odd is phrased in, in event to complement ratio, whereas probability is phrased in event to sample space ratio. So that's also an interesting thing to think about and to know when you get in, you know, people who, you know, maybe bet on games, not saying you should, right? But, you know, a lot of times gambling uses odds. They're not very common in other places, but they are very common in health research. So it, it's worth having a concept of what odds might be. Now, if you, if you thought about this example and you realized that we had six nodes with six nodes, which ended up with 36 possibilities in the sample space, you might have realized that there is a better way than drawing those huge tree diagrams. They can look really cool, but they are cumbersome in my opinion, especially when you're dealing with a lot of different things. So the fundamental counting principle says that if event A can occur in A ways and event B can occur in B ways, then the sample space for the combinations of events A and B in sequence is A times B. Simply said here, if die one that's a, you know, can occur in six ways, and die two can come up with six ways, then the sample space, we take those things, A times B, right, six times six, and we come up with the potential sample space. So you just say, how many ways can this thing happen, right? There's six possibilities. There's six possibilities. If I multiply those, I find out there's 36 possibilities. So if we return back to our idea of like buying a car, imagine that you know there's four colors of interest and four uh, types of vehicle make that you're interested in. So if there's four colors and four vehicles, then you could get a white Chevy, a blue Chevy, a black Chevy, or a red Chevy, right? That's four. You could get a white Ford, a blue Ford, a black Ford, or a red Ford. That's four. You get a white Dodge, a blue Dodge, a black Dodge, or a red Dodge. That's four. You can get a white Nissan, a blue Nissan, a black Nissan, or a red Nissan. That's four. So if there's four colors and four makes that I'm interested in, we realize we have four times four or 16 possibilities in our sample space. So this is the idea of the fundamental counting principle. It's a pretty straightforward thing, especially when we're dealing with just the classic view of probability. And we'll talk more about those views of probability next.